Good morning. I hope everyone's had a chance to get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, something to eat, whatever you need to get this wonderful morning jump started. I'm very grateful to the weather gods for having given us such a perfect day for a conference so that we can all huddle together in this room for the next day and a half and pity everybody who has to be out in this weather. My name is Janaki Bakhle and I'm the director of the South Asia Institute and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to Caste and Contemporary India, a conference in commemoration of one of Columbia University's most famous and eminent alumni, Dr. Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar. We're all familiar with Ambedkar as the drafter of the Indian Constitution and the leader of the movement in India against untouchability and casteism. Yet more than 50 years after Indian independence, caste prejudice, caste atrocities, caste discrimination, caste-based oppression remain deeply entrenched features of Indian political life. Our four conference panels are all concerned with contemporary India, contemporary India. And the panelists will address and discuss Ambedkar's legacy as it has manifested itself in the law of modern India, in the gendered character of caste relations, in electoral and other politics, and in religious conversions away from Hinduism. I will leave it to the panels and the panelists to discuss these issues. And at the risk of sounding like an NPR station, I need to acknowledge the sources of additional funding for this program and let you know as well that our fall fund drive will begin after the conference tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. But speaking seriously, the Institute simply could not have organized this conference by itself, let alone bring seven scholars from different locations in India to New York without a little bit of help. And I'd like to thank our co-sponsors Beginning with the Institute for Religion, Culture, and Public Life, the first of our co-sponsors to sign on. And I'd like to extend a hearty vote of gratitude to Al Steppen for being so encouraging, both in word and in deed, for this conference. As well as thank his co-director, Mark Taylor, who I hope we will see a little later today. I'd also like to note that the Center for Human Rights Documentation and Research, a virtual documentation exhibition of documents created by South Asia bibliographer Bindu Bhatt is posted on the website of the South Asia collection of the Columbia Library. The center was instrumental in providing the services that allow us to document the conference as a digital recording, which will be available through Columbia University's website. And I thank Pamela Graham, Area Studies Librarian, for helping to negotiate that digital recording. I'd also like to thank the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race and the director, Francis Negron Montaner, who will be with us later this evening, and Sudhir Venkatesh, who is the director of the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy. The Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies was also forthcoming with their help, and the chair, Shudipto Kaviraj, not only gave us funding, but will introduce our closing plenary speaker tomorrow, Gopal Guru. The Provost's Office, in particular the past Provost Alan Brinkley and the current Provost Claude Steele, have also been very helpful in allowing us to bring some scholars over from India. Raj Kamble and the Ambedkar International Mission of North America have been consistent in their encouragement to me to pull together a conference like this, and I'm very grateful for his help. Lenny Gordon and the Tariknath Das Foundation made it possible for us to invite Gopal Guru to be our first ever Tariknath Das visiting professor at the South Asia Institute and he will be with us for two weeks starting today. We're also very grateful to Columbia University President Lee Bollinger whose schedule, as you might imagine, is very full and yet he's taken time out on a blustery Friday morning to come speak to us about affirmative action and the comparison with caste and reservations. We're very grateful to him for doing that, as well as Nick Dirks, Christoph Jaffrelo, Anupama Rao, Gauri Vishwanath, and Thomas Hansen for agreeing to serve as panel moderators and introducers. Before I turn things over to Nick Dirks for the first panel, there are a few announcements I need to make. Barring the panelists, there is no food or drink allowed in this room except for water bottles. This is at the insistence of the building management. And I thank you all for your cooperation. I've also been asked to 
let you all know that while there is a coat check outside and you can leave your belongings there, please keep valuables with you at all times. Secondly, while I'm concluding this welcome, do please take a second to turn off your cell phones or move them to vibrate or quiet mode or whatever it is so that the panel is not disturbed by ringtones and so on. Mm. Our program on Friday, today, we'll have three panels. The first, which should have started at nine o'clock, but in wonderful South Asian time, it will begin perhaps five minutes later than planned. But the first panel at nine o'clock, the second at 11.15, and the third at 2.15. We will have breaks for coffee and lunch. Coffee is available, coffee tea is available outside throughout the day and all of tomorrow. So please feel free, if you need to take a break to get coffee outside, we just ask that you don't bring it inside. No lunch will be provided today, but we are inviting all of you to please stay after Gyan Pandey's plenary address for a reception at 5.45. The reception will be outside in the foyer and we'd like to invite all of you to join us for that reception and an informal conversation with all of the panelists. Tomorrow, Saturday, there'll be a morning panel at 9.15. I apologize for the earliness of the panel, but such is academic life. We have to start early in the morning. And we will have a closing plenary address by Artarak Nathas, visiting professor, Gopal Guru, at 11.30. In the spirit of keeping the South Asian Institute South Asian and not merely Indian, we've organized a Sri Lankan lunch tomorrow. Please join us for that lunch at 1 p.m. in the lobby. If it gets too crowded in the lobby, we have additional seating in rooms 1510 and 1512. One last announcement before I turn this over to Nick Dirks. There are 10 of us wearing, 11 of us now, with my student Christopher from my undergraduate class, Gandhi's India, who volunteered, as well as Rashida, who volunteered to come and help out with this conference. So there will be 12 of us wearing blue name tags, Columbia blue name tags. If you have any questions about the conference, about the schedule, or where to find the best food in the neighborhood, please feel free to ask. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Nicholas Dirks, the moderator of the first panel, to come up here to introduce the first panel and the panelists and President Bollinger. Thank you very much, and at the risk of uh, conflict of interest, uh, I am going to uh, include in the list of thanks, thanks to the director of the Southern Asian Institute, Janaki Buckley, professor of history, who has worked tirelessly, and I can attest to that, uh, to organize uh, this event uh, and has been doing so over the course of some months, so uh, I'm uh, delighted to recognize uh, her role. This is a conference to examine the place of caste in contemporary India. But it is also to celebrate the connection of B.R. Ambedkar to, to Columbia University. It is here that Ambedkar studied and earned a PhD in political science. Even closer to home for me, it is here that Ambedkar wrote his first paper on, this, on the caste system, uh, delivering it in Franz Boas's famous anthropology seminar in 1916, in which he argued that a combination of the social logic of endogamous exclusion and the <coughs> role of uh, prestige attached to the Brahmin in Hindu religion uh, combined to produce the extraordinary uh, uh, durability and hold of the caste system. And it is here at Columbia that Ambedkar began his study of the political character and effects of different kinds of political institutions, including the Constitution, or at least other constitutions than India's. He would go on, of course, to play a major role in that. Although Ambedkar went on from Columbia to do his formal legal training at the London School of Economics, we like to claim a very special role for <laughs> Columbia in the conception and drafting of the Indian Constitution, which bans discrimination based on untouchability and enshrines a number of critical principles framing provisions for reservations or reserved seats in education and government employment for historically oppressed groups, classified, of course, on the basis of the sociological categories of caste and tribe. 
As a university, we take great pride in our connection to Ambedkar, in the extraordinary accomplishments of his life fighting against injustice, and in his lifelong commitment to finding and using political and legal means to redress the social and cultural legacies of oppression and discrimination. For B.R. Ambedkar, caste was the principal impediment to social justice, equality, and reform in India. But caste for him was not just a civil institution, for it was inseparable from the beliefs and institutions of Hinduism more generally. Despite this latter concern, one that stayed with him throughout his life and led ultimately, for him, to him, led ultimately to lead him to convert to Buddhism just the year before he died. He was both a social activist and a constitutional lawyer. He led marches and demonstrations, wrote tracts and gave speeches, while also making perhaps his most enduring mark through his role as principal architect of the Indian Constitution, convinced as he was that untouchables could only thrive through constitutional guarantees for non-discrimination and reservations in educational opportunity, employment, and political representation. Born in 1891 into a Maharashtrian Mahar, then called untouchable family, Ambedkar studied in army cantonments and then in Bombay, graduating from Elphinstone College in Bombay in 1912. His educational attainment and, so and, and, and social distinction gained the recognition of the Maharaja Gaikwad of Baroda, who gave him a scholarship for travel here to New York to Columbia where he studied towards his PhD, as I said, in political science. He only actually received his degree in 1927, uh, but he was here in the years just before and at the outbreak of World War I. After uh, returning from London, where he also uh, did his legal work at the LSE, he returned to practice as a lawyer in Baroda, finding that despite his educational ex attainments and accomplishments, he was unable to rent rooms in town and he was the victim of continual insults having to do with his caste status. So he moved to Bombay where he became a college lecturer and a practitioner before the Bombay High Court. In 1927, he was officially nominated to the Legislative Council as one of the two representatives of the depressed classes. During the next two decades, he maintained a role as a prominent figure in official circles as well as in government, at the same time that he took up a series of political and social struggles on behalf of his fellow, again I say untouchables, but of course we now uh, say Dalits, including the cause of educational access, the work towards abolishing traditional village duties, a campaign, various campaigns to gain access to public water, and of course repeated movements uh, for temple access for D Dalit groups. Ambedkar also mounted several dramatic symbolic assaults on Hindu scriptures, illustrating his sense that since caste was so integral to Hinduism, the religion itself had to be questioned uh, and deeply scrutinized. Even as Ambedkar took Gandhi on over the question of whether religion and caste could be detached from each other, he famously dueled with Gandhi over separate electorates for untouchables. The quarrel took on epic proportion in 1932 when Gandhi announced a fast unto death over the establishment by Ramsay MacDonald of a separate electorate for untouchables in large part as a consequence of Ambedkar's advocacy of, the, of, of depressed classes' interests at the Roundtable Conference. Gandhi was opposed to separate electorates for any group. He grudgingly accepted them for Muslims, for Christians, for Sikhs, and for and Anglo-Indians, but drew the line when it came to Dalits. The communal award of August 17, 1932 granted uh, Dalits Ambedkar's demand for separate electorates in areas of their largest concentration, and that is what led to the fast. Ambedkar ultimately had to give in to Gandhi's plea, uh, although they worked out a compromise known as the Pune Pact, uh, in which the electorate was maintained as joint, while the numbers of seats specifically reserved for untouchable groups was doubled. And this was a huge rupture in the history of Indian nationalism, and it continues in some sense to underwrite and carry on uh, with later debates over how to think about the nature of the Dalit community vis-a-vis -vis the Hindu majority. Throughout his life, Ambedkar oscillated between legal and political advocacy for the role of depressed classes in Indian society and symbolic protests against the deep stigmatization produced by caste and its core relationship to Hinduism itself. His concern about incorporation into the Hindu fold put him in conflict with many Hindu leaders, claiming untouchables as part of the Indian Hindu majority, a claim uh, 
he decisively rejected when he converted to Buddhism and indeed advocated the mass conversion to Buddhism of all Dalit groups. In his role in drafting and framing the Indian constitution, Ambedkar successfully advocated for a policy of compensatory discrimination, a very strong form of affirmative action for the scheduled castes. These, these are the uh, Dalit groups that had been denominated by uh, the government as scheduled, put on a particular schedule, and tribal groups as well called the scheduled tribes. And the Constitution declared, and Ambedkar played a great role in the framing of these words, I'll quote, the state shall promote with special care the educational and economic interests of the weaker sections of the people, and in particular, the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, and shall protect them from social injustice and all forms of exploitation, end of quote. The Constitution's ban on discrimination in government employment explicitly permit, permits the state to go on to make, though, in addition to this, and I quote again, any provision for the reservation of appointments or posts in favor of any backward class of citizens, which, in the opinion of the state, is not adequately represented in the services under the state, end of quote. And in particular, in regard to efforts not just to ban discrimination, but to counter its legacies and its continuing effects, the Constitution further stipulated that the discrimination clause specifically shall not, I quote, prevent the state from making any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, end of quote. Provisions banning discrimination and declaring the principle of individual equality thus had to sit side by side with provisions that made clear not only that special provisions be made, but that they be made through the use of reservations. The Constitution initially dictated reservations that in effect set aside roughly 22% of seats in government employment, legislative positions, and educational institutions for scheduled tribes and castes. While it framed the hope that such reservations would not be necessary in perpetuity, it also allowed for their continuation, up to a maximum of 50%. Now, as we are having this conference here at Columbia, indeed, uh, uh, one of the uh, most distinguished among American universities, but also one that has struggled, like many of our peers, with the legacies of our own countries, and in this case, of our city's history. It is, I think, fitting that we begin our examination of the history and consequences of affirmative action in India with specific reference to the history and current condition of affirmative action here in the U.S., and especially in U.S. universities. It is therefore especially fitting that we do so given the role of the president of Columbia University, Lee Bollinger, in framing the contemporary debate over affirmative action. One of the nation's leading scholars of First Amendment issues, he has taught and written on freedom of speech in the press for over 30 years and has a book, in fact, a new book on the place of the press in a new global and, of course, new economic uh, environment coming out just in a few months, I think. But in addition to his work as a scholar on First Amendment issues, freedom of the press and the like, uh, he was also the named defendant in the twin 2003 Supreme Court cases that clarified and upheld affirmative action in higher education. And President Bollinger became, uh, in part through that, a national advocate for diversity and for integration. In recognition of his leadership on these issues, he received the National Humanitarian Award from the National Conference for Community and Justice and the National Equal Justice Award from the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, among many other honors, including the Clark Kerr Award, which is the highest honor conferred by the faculty of the University of California for his service to higher education, especially in matters relating both to freedom of speech and diversity. President Bollinger is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and prior to coming to Columbia, served as the president of the University of Michigan, where he was also dean of the law school and a law professor. Now, this panel for me is a personal pleasure uh, and a bit of a uh, reminder of the first time I ever met Lee Bollinger, which was at the University of Michigan in 1996, shortly before I was to move to Columbia, where I gave a paper on the aftermath of the Mundell Commission's report and the controversy surrounding questions having to do with reservations in the 1990s. And President Bollinger took time out of his busy schedule then to come and listen to the paper, and then, and now I should have known better, asked me the hardest questions I got all evening in the uh, seminar that ensued. But he made me think deeply at that point about the similarities as well as the differences of the Indian and American experiences 
and uh, it made me also feel the need for the kinds of things that we do in area studies context to be brought out and moved into conversation with and comparison against uh, other cases, but of course, in some ways, chief among them, the case within which we live, which is to say, in this case, the case of the struggle over affirmative action in, in the United States. Whether dealing with the historical leg legacies of slavery and racial discrimination or caste oppression and caste-based forms of discrimination, it is inescapable that these two great democracies, India and the United States, have struggled to enshrine principles of individual equality while also seeking to address the tremendous historical and sociological impediments to equality that continue to the present day. But these two countries have done so very differently, even though histories of caste and race, of untouchability and slavery, share so much in common. Differences intensified in the US case around the famous Bakke case of 1978, when Justice Powell made his declaration about the value of diversity for all, not just for oppressed groups. President Bollinger himself defended the University of Michigan's admission policies around principles of diversity, not by defending quotas or reservations, and of course the outcome of Grutter and Gratz, short-lived though they might have been in Michigan itself for reasons that perhaps we'll go into, was one that put further restrictions on a system that might look in any instance like it was using quantitative rather than qualitative measures. President Bollinger is joined in this panel by two scholars and we could not uh, be luckier to have uh, the assembled uh, group here this morning. Mark Gallanter, who has been for many years professor of law and South Asian studies at the University of Wisconsin, wrote perhaps the seminal work on the history of compensatory discrimination in India, a book entitled Competing Equalities, Law and the Backward Classes in India. It's also written Law and Society in Modern India, along with many, many other essays and works relating to uh, some of the issues that we're addressing today. And we're delighted that he drove in from Madison to join us uh, at our panel. And Pratap Banu Mehta, who is the president of the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, and also the author of Burden of Democracy, co-editor of a work entitled Public Institutions in India Performance and Design, and hard at work uh, on a major study of the Indian Supreme Court, uh, extended his stay at NYU in order to be with us this morning before he flies back to Delhi and his role in the center uh, there uh, this evening. So the format uh, that we're going to follow this morning will be I'm going to ask President Bollinger to begin by framing uh, the case of affirmative action and some of the issues that uh, would most parallel the kinds of discussions we're having vis-a-vis -vis the case of India uh, to start things off. I will then ask Professor Gallanter to say a little bit about the history of uh, legislation and constitutional debate around issues of affirmative action and compensatory discrimination. And then I will ask Professor Mehta to say a bit about more recent debates within India as well as the contemporary context and environment uh, for thinking about issues uh, relating to uh, affirmative action, in particular vis-a-vis -vis questions around educational institutions. After we hear from each of them, we'll start a conversation among us, and then uh, we'll uh, move into taking questions and comments uh, from all of you, and we'll uh, shoot to be done at 10.45 uh, as per uh, our instructions. Good. Thank you. So please uh, join me in thanking Lee Bollinger for coming and joining us this morning. Uh, John Key, this is a tremendous uh, thing to do uh, for the university and more broadly, and I'm um, delighted to be part of it. Uh, the panel, I couldn't be happier uh, uh, having the prospect of being able to listen to what uh, they have to say. This is really about India, not about uh, the United States. Uh, but um, uh, I need to learn more, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to learning more. Uh, what I will do is simply outline very quickly uh, my sort of interpretation of affirmative action in the United States, which I think falls into nicely into three parts. Uh, and then, uh, of course, leave it open to uh, any kind of comparisons. Uh, that we can draw. I, I would say just this by way of opening. Uh, I think we all understand how uh, comparative work is very, very important, uh, but it does seem to me that uh, it's important to take the next step uh, 
uh, and that is uh, we're in the process of creating, it seems to me, a kind of global society. Uh, and even though it's still very much um, individual nation states uh, uh, and all that comes with that, and even though they're very weak international institutions uh, for governing uh, the world, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the way the world is evolving, especially uh, through uh, capitalism and free markets uh, and becoming more and more interdependent, that the course of the next several decades will be to create the kind of institutions that will be needed uh, to, um, to deal with that world, that more integrated world. Uh, the most recent move from a G7 to a G20 is I think just one among many steps along that path and the point is that uh, affirmative action, the concept, uh, the effort, the need for it uh, will be something that we will face globally uh, as well as uh, uh, interestingly in individual nation states. So I think it has that, th this kind of meeting, this kind of discussion has that extremely important uh, sort of forward-looking uh, role. There's great variation in this room. Um, I know many uh, of the faces here, uh, great variation in the degree of um, knowledge, I assume, about the U.S. affirmative action uh, uh, issues. So uh, I'll try to be uh, both um, uh, respectful of, of those who know uh, just about as much as uh, anyone uh, and f those who, for whom this is a, a fresh subject. As I said, I think it really falls into three sort of periods. And the first period is 1954 uh, to the, um, let's say, 1970. I think then it's 1970 until uh, the cases that um, uh, Nick referred to, uh, the Grutter case, the Gratz case, Grutter case, the Gratz case, uh, which came out of the University of Michigan in which I was a, a named defendant and um, uh, the person most responsible for sort of leading the defense of affirmative action. And, and I think it's from that, so it's 19, 70 until that case in 1997 or 2003, which is when the Supreme Court rendered its opinions, and then we're in that third period now. <clears throat> the first period is really uh, Brown versus Board of Education. The Brown versus Board of Education declared that uh, official segregation and discrimination on the basis of race was uh, a violation of a fundamental norm uh, enshrined in the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution and could no longer uh, stand. Uh, there's a lot of argument about whether this would have happened if the Supreme Court had not uh, taken this step, which it did unanimously. Would the society have come to the same judgment that this was a violation <clears throat> of fundamental uh, values? Um, my own view, is, these things are hard to determine, my own view is that it would not have happened but for being in the Constitution and for an independent judiciary uh, that could point to uh, this as a basic inconsistency between the ideals of the society uh, and the underlying practice of invidious discrimination on the basis of race. Brown set in motion for the next 20 years an effort not only to end discrimination and segregation but to achieve uh, integration. That, too, is a debate within American society. But it's a very, very important, uh, I think, step uh, in our thinking. It would not be sufficient to think about simply ending uh, discrimination. There was too much that had happened over the preceding two centuries uh, that had to be overcome. Uh, and uh, this was not uh, just a matter of law, it was a matter of hearts and minds, and so the society uh, had a major uh, effort to try to achieve integration. Uh, the busing cases were prime examples of this, uh, so for the next, um, again, 20 years, uh, in the specific area of public education, the country undertook effort after effort to find ways to take children 
uh, from uh, different schools had, that had formerly been uh, segregated and to integrate them and busing was the way to do it. This became a lightning rod for many in the society. Uh, it was a, a, an effort to transform uh, the way in which the uh, society was, uh, was fundamentally structured. Uh, it turned out not only uh, in just having separate schools, but having separate housing patterns and se separate places uh, to uh, work and, and live. Uh, so that uh, busing became the um, uh, highly controversial. Uh, the other point to realize about this period is that it, it was deeply, deeply rooted in a sense of centuries of injustice that the society really had harmed uh, in the most serious ways um, uh, a group and groups, uh, Native Americans, Hispanics, uh, and most especially perhaps uh, most visibly because of the Brown case, African Americans, had actively uh, injured uh, populations within the society and this had to be uh, corrected. That became not only an organizing principle for how to deal with race and ethnicity in American society, but it became an organizing principle for almost every area of life in the society. And by that I mean, if you look at the First Amendment cases, which I uh, uh, teach and write about and so on, many of those prime cases were about race. They were about civil rights. Brown, or, um, New York Times versus Sullivan is, is that to its core. We think of uh, that as a great press freedom. You can't uh, hold a newspaper or press libel uh, for false statements of fact that hurt somebody's reputation unless you can prove actual malice. Well, that case arose out of a New York Times edition with the civil rights ad, 23 copies, or uh, I'm sorry, a few hundred copies distributed in Alabama uh, about uh, trying to raise money for civil rights, and that was an Alabama jury uh, that, uh, that brought that uh, judgment against the New York Times, and the Supreme Court said no. It was as much about race as it was uh, about, um, uh, about free speech. And you can go to criminal justice, you can go all across the, the society, and you can find the effects of the efforts to overcome the history of racial prejudice and discrimination in the society reshaping American life. The second period I would describe as going from about 1970, early 70s, until the, uh, until the 2003 Supreme Court cases. What defines that, that's, that's really when affirmative action comes into uh, play. And it really comes into effect in universities. Uh, universities were very much behind the civil rights movement. They were the origins of lots of ideas and, and protests and, and uh, uh, public action, but they, uh, uh, so they were unanimous, uh, basically, in wanting this value. And when it came time to introduce affirmative action, that's the place where I think it was most willingly embraced. And it was done almost out of frustration. That is, the busing efforts, the, the tremendous efforts of the society for the 20 years following Brown versus Board of Education had not really produced what people had expected. And so affirmative action was meant to integrate the society. Um, there must be judges who are African American. There must be lawyers. There must be doctors. There must be business people. There must be media people. I mean, the sense was this society will only deal with these problems when there is true integration and affirmative action is critical to that. The Bakke case that, um, that Nick referred to is in uh, the late 70s. And what happened was that defined this period, this 30-year period, was the effort to normalize affirmative action in American society. And by that I mean, while the first period was to link it to the roots of the society's past, the second period was to disconnect it from the past and to make it seem as if this were just a normal kind of American life. And the famous opinion of Justice Powell in the Bakke case upholding affirmative action in higher education really made this point without ever saying that that's what was happening. What Powell said was, 
if you're a university and you have affirmative action, we will let you do it, but only if you say that it is for diversity pur purposes, for educational value, and not if you say it's, try to, it's an attempt to correct for past injustices in the society. So when I was dean of the law school of Michigan in and, and, um, uh, 1987 and I were defending affirmative action, I could never ever say that the reason why we do this is because there are 200 years of history of slavery and discrimination and so on, and this society has to overcome it, and we as an institution are prepared to, to do that. We could never say it because there would be a lawsuit instantly and it would be declared unconstitutional. So I interpret that and all that happened as an effort to normalize, disconnect from its past uh, what affirmative action was all about. When I became president of Michigan in 97, uh, I heard immediately that we were going to be sued by the conservative group that was uh, bringing lawsuits around the country. They'd been very successful. They had won against the University of Texas Law School. There had been a movement in California, Prop 209, which had passed ending affirmative action, and we were next. Uh, we had to decide whether, I had to decide whether to defend this and take it on uh, or whether to uh, give in. At that moment in 1997-98, it was overwhelmingly unpopular to defend affirmative action. It was not a, uh, a, a really um, persuasive uh, position. We decided to take it on. Um, and for the next uh, five years, six years, uh, this was uh, a, a, just a major undertaking. Uh, I won't go through the cases. The, the point I want to make is that my view was the only way this could win was to do both things that had happened in the first two periods. Affirmative action had to be connected back to its roots, that this was an effort and it was still needed in order to overcome centuries of discrimination and the society had this task and it would only happen in several generations. We wish it would happen sooner, but it wasn't. And the second thing was that we had to normalize it and say it was part of diversity. And those two really interacted. Uh, you, the only reason diversity matters, education, is because of the history. And the effort to distinguish them was, was a, a mistake, but we had to make both arguments. I made a decision that I would never refer to Baki I would always refer to Brown. Uh, I would never, um, so, and, and the other point was we had to make this something that was pervasive in American society. You unravel this and you're back to before Brown because every institution in the society had embraced this and that's where we got the military brief that was so um, uh, well known as saying if you, uh, tell universities they can't have affirmative action, then the military will not be able to have affirmative action. And if they can't have affirmative action, which they practice, they will not have an officer corps that is integrated to deal with the military. That just showed how pervasive in American society this was. And uh, fortunately, the uh, decision came down in 2003, five to four, very narrow. It was really Sandra Day O'Connor was the crucial vote that it could continue. And it embraced both sort of rationales uh, of history and diversity, and then did the final thing, which I think was odd, and yet uh, there it is, that's the world we're living in, put a cap, a time cap on this, a limit of 25 years. It was an odd thing, the Supreme Court never does that. I mean, it never says, uh, you can do this as a constitutional matter, but you can only do it for X period of years. And it's an interesting feature of where we are at the moment. There is a kind of, of lapse in the, pro, in the historical process, uh, and we'll see uh, where it goes from there. So that's my take on American uh, affirmative action, and I very much look forward to hearing how it works in India. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to 
be here. Um, I uh, just want to make a few points uh, in terms of the background of, uh, of uh, what some of us call compensatory discrimination in India, the, uh, as in the description of the beneficiary groups, there's all kinds of terminological uh, questions about what you should call this policy. In fact, uh, the name compensatory discrimination hasn't really caught on. Most people just say reservations, uh, which is the uh, typical device. Uh, basically, we're talking about reserved seats, quotas, uh, the typical device used in India in both educational and uh, settings and in, in government jobs as well. Those are the two central programs. There's also um, uh, reservations of seats in parliament. These are the descendants of the, the Pune Pact that, that uh, Nick referred to. Uh, we'll come to that in a minute. But so, but, stepping back even a little further, I want to just say that uh, the whole notion that caste subordination and hierarchy is a problem to be solved, of course, is, a, is something that has from time to time surfaced in, in India historically, but r really uh, moves into the political realm uh, first in the, in the, uh, intermittently in the 19th century with uh, Jyotirel Phule. Uh, and uh, at the turn of the century, beginning of the 20th century, with some progressive uh, uh, princes, uh, and um, it's uh, and with that, in the early 20th century, uh, I think for the for the first time, or at least for the first time in connection with 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 political arrangements, the uh, low castes throughout India. Uh, are envisioned as an India-wide stratum. Uh, the term at the time was the depressed classes, uh, which doesn't exactly correspond to the group that has emerged now as the Dalits, but it's pretty close. Uh, and um, in the maneuver in the early 20th century, uh, with the anticipation of, of, of uh, more Indian uh, political participation and eventual control. Uh, there was this dispute about who is the representative, who's, who's the, who speaks for this uh, depressed stratum. And uh, uh, Nick has said a little bit about the conflict between uh, Gandhi and Dr. Ambedkar on this. Uh, and what the, what the eventual compromise that he mentioned was one where uh, seats were in in the uh, in the legislatures were reserved for the uh, then untouchables who were then uh, got a new name scheduled castes. Uh, because they were listed in a schedule at the end of the Government of India Act of 1936. Uh, so they got reserved seats. Only members of these groups were eligible to run for the seats. But these were not separate electorates. These are what they call joint electorates, uh, reservations. Only these people can stand for, for office, but everybody votes. Uh, the, the original compromise included a, a, a provision for kind of primary elections in which only the members of the scheduled caste would, would vote, but those dropped by the wayside. They were just never, never uh, implemented. It turned out to be ex expensive, and, and it just fell by the wayside. Uh, but as part of the Government of India Act 1936, the question was we're going to compile an official definitive list of this, of the groups that make up this depressed stratum that's going to get special representation in parliament. It wasn't parliament then, it was the various state legislature, 
legislatures of the various units of British India. Uh, now, so the commission went around to, uh, to uh, compile a list of these scheduled castes, and there was some uncertainty as to who was included because uh, in spite of this being envisioned as an all India uh, stratum, uh, there really were significant uh, differences from place to place in, in, the, the, in what the caste hierarchies were like uh, and what the various practices were and how definitely this, uh, the, the uh, bottom stratum, so to speak, was, was uh, delimited and, and, uh, and, and visibly uh, distinct. Uh, but uh, when you have to make a list, uh, you end up with a list. And so uh, the list was there uh, after, uh, at the time of independence, just 10 years uh, after this, uh, there, uh, w with, with a, a very different political setting, uh, the provisions for special treatment for, for uh, the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes were put into the Constitution. Uh, and so this is 1950, and now we have uh, a definite authorization for special treatment for these groups uh, as a qualification to the non-discrimination provisions of the Constitution. But one, there's one complication, and here I have to sort of, uh, circle back a little bit. Because in the early 19th, in the early 20th century, while the, the, there were moves to, to um, ameliorate the condition and eventually to define and these, the depressed classes schedule cast stratum, there were other groups uh, mostly a bit higher on the, in the caste hierarchy. Uh, which we've come to call uh, the backward classes. Now, sometimes the term backward classes is used to include the scheduled castes and tribes, but so to, it, 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 sometimes the term is used other backward classes or OBCs uh, as this stratum above, uh, in, in traditional thinking, above the scheduled castes. Uh, and you'll notice that the provisions in the Constitution for special, because those groups tended in some regions, particularly in the south of India, a little bit in the west of India, to have uh, successfully uh, uh, seized uh, a, a, a chunk of, of power in the, in the local, uh, in, in local politics, uh, and and had instituted reservations in jobs and in education for themselves, uh, sometimes including some provision for the, for the lowest strata as well. Uh, so in l large parts of India, the, there were already reservations for these backward classes. Uh, the Constitution, if you read the debates in the Constitution, the, a lot of people, particularly from North India, didn't quite understand uh, these provisions, and uh, people from the South were kind of reassuring and said, yes, yeah, we've got all these. And so the terminology put in for special treatment in the Constitution was sufficiently inclusive as to basically uh, endorse and legitimate these uh, local arrangements for the OBCs as well as creating these new, uh, uh, as well as giving the basis for a, a, a set of new uh, preferential treatment for the schedule castes and schedule tribes. And this, uh, this ambiguity about just who the beneficiaries are uh, is, has sort of been one of the, the defining characteristics of what, what's been going on in India for the last uh, 
60 years. Uh, so we, the Constitution does provide for reservations uh, for these uh, favored uh, castes in government jobs and higher education. There's a lot of other little preferences, but those are the, 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 the really important ones. Uh, but then the question is, well, just what is this group, the backward classes, which includes scheduled castes and tribes, but what is, what is this group uh, and who's going to define it? Because remember, the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, the definition, the list of those people was just carried over from the government of India from 1936, put in the Constitution. Uh, but who are the backward classes? And there were, <laughs> the Constitution makers punted. They just said, well, we're going to set up a commission, and this commission will definitively decide. Uh, the commission came back in 1955 with a very expansive definition of who the backward classes were, about 80% of the population of India. And the government, the government uh, of the time, a, a strongly entrenched Congress government with a very solid uh, supermajority, just uh, brushed it aside and decided not to implement it at all. And so, and the question was kind of laid to rest for the next 20 years. Uh, and uh, at, at that time, and I remember sort of uh, trying to do some research on this, and people said, why are you researching this whole question of the backward classes and caste? And that, that's all, you know, it's on its way out. Uh, find a better topic. Uh, and they said, because India is moving toward a casteless and classless society. That was the, the mantra of, uh, of the time. And um, so uh, in the meanwhile, uh, the South had sort of retained at the state level various kinds of benefits for the backward classes. The backward classes movement that were in, in the northern states pretty much pretty much, uh, it was pretty much defunct. Until the great break in sort of in the history of independent India, the emergency of 1975-77, when, uh, which br brought into power temporarily a, a, a coalition government, uh, the first real alternative to the Congress, and that Coalition government said, uh, in order to, to uh, try and build political support, said we should have a second backward classes commission to go out and find out who these people really are. The second backward classes commission, known as the Mundal Commission, and Pratap is going to talk about that. So he's going to pick up the story at that point. But I would say that that um, the the uh, with that suddenly this regime of preferential programs for scheduled castes and tribes was suddenly expanded. And now the, there were a lot of, of new preferential treatments at the center eventually e e coming for these middle groups, so to speak. So that the provisions, the, the original affirmative action uh, for, the, for the lowest and the say, marginalized groups, the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, uh, were now enfolded in a much larger program uh, of, of preferential treatment. And um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, this, uh, the commission, the, the Mandel Commission came in taking a very expansive view of who the beneficiaries could be. Uh, and uh, so what we've had since then is, is this uh, enlarged notion of affirmative action or compensatory discrimination. Uh, enlarged because now uh, in various ways about 70% of the whole population is eligible uh, uh, for, for some level of benefits. Uh, the judiciary has Basically, the, all the political parties competing have now decided to be on the side of this affirmative action. Uh, there's, there's no real political dissent. There's some kind of social groups that, that dissent from it. The judges, 
and the Supreme Court, and you have to realize the Indian Supreme Court is, is, uh, the, is an arbiter of what the Constitution is, of kind of unparalleled power, much more uh, powerful in some ways than the U.S. Supreme Court in the sense that, one, even though it has, the terms of the justices are rather short because of, of, of uh, compulsory retirement. Nevertheless, the judges basically control appointments to their court at this point. This is a rather new development, last 20 years. Uh, and um, so the, the court basically uh, controls its own membership and it has asserted that it has the right to not only to determine what the Constitution, the present text of the Constitution means, like our the US Supreme Court does, but they say also, though the amendment process is rather easy in Parliament and keeps throwing up amendments, any, it just, just takes a two thirds of a majority in Parliament. But the court says, we are the judge of whether the amendments fit the basic structure of the Constitution, and it's only amendments that comply with the basic structure that will become valid parts of the Constitution, which we will then interpret. Uh, so, uh, so we have this, this very interesting kind of institutional divide between the judiciary, which has been uh, the cautious and limiting uh, institution as far as this affirmative action goes, and parliament uh, and legislatures, which at this point have been, have been, they've been the accelerator and the, the uh, courts have been, been the brakes. But the courts have been much more uh, uh, restrictive in, poli uh, in policing the benefits for the other backward classes. And the courts have basically said, you can have all the provisions you like for the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, but much more limited uh, preferential treatment for the OBCs. And the, the, the kind of signature uh, question here is, what's called the question of the creamy layer. Uh, what, the, what the courts have said is, yes, you can make provision for these other backward classes. And those are basically kind of middle, I mean, it, there's a big range from people down almost at the bottom to people almost at the top. And uh, so they say, when we have these provisions, you have to eliminate the very well-off people within the backward classes, the so-called creamy layer. We don't want people who've sort of arrived already and have high government jobs and have lots of money to be able to perpetuate their, they can perpetuate their, their good fortune, but we're not gonna help them with special preferential treatment. So, so each state is, obliged to take the most successful groups within its, its backward classes and basically uh, take them out of, out of, out of the running. Uh, this has caused great perturbation. The, 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 the rest of the political universe in India does not like this. So there's a, a, a real tension between the courts and the legislatures, as I say, but as as accelerators or brakes on this, on the administration of affirmative action. Uh, I'm gonna, so th this is kind of the, the, the broad setting and I will let Pratap uh, fill you in on the details. Um. In the interests of time, uh, and to be brief, I won't sort of take you through a kind of blow-by-blow blow account of uh, uh, developments post Mandal. I mean, I think most of you are familiar with the basic architecture of the reservation regime, as it's called. I think Mark has laid out its elements. Not 
Technically, it's capped at 50%. Uh, this includes both reservation for scheduled castes and OBCs. Uh, although Tamil Nadu, it exceeds that, and the Supreme Court will not, I don't think, pronounce on a petition challenging Tamil Nadu's exceeding of 50% anytime soon, uh, because I think it fears the political consequences of ruling one way or, 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 or the other. Uh, I just want to make a, a couple of points, I think, which, which will bring the discussion back to both contemporary politics and perhaps link it back up to Ambedkar. Uh, Ambedkar was a powerful emancipatory figure and a very interesting political strategist. And I think one of the interesting questions to ask about caste in contemporary politics is what has the regime of reservation as we now know it done to the narrative that Ambedkar in a sense was trying to bring forth about modern India? And that narrative had sort of two components. One was, in a sense, the component relating specifically to what we now call Dalits, right? I mean, in a sense, uh, uh, articulating right? uh, their historical marginalization in, in, in an absolutely extraordinary way, thinking about instruments to overcome it, but also, at the same time, marrying the project of Dalit emancipation to a much broader constitutional vision that is broad, broadly liberal constitutionalist. So it's not just equality, it is freedom. I mean, I mean it's, it's both sides. It's not just the, the, the special privileges. It's, it's all the standard liberal articles of the Indian constitution. Now, I think what's happening right now in the discourse of caste in India is both those elements are in the danger of being lost. And one way of thinking about this is the following way. Um, this refers back to, in a sense, President Bollinger's account that what is important is to try and understand and have some clarity over what the narrative about affirmative action is. And you can think of seven different objectives that affirmative action might perform. Firstly, it's simply an instrument for non-discrimination, very low baseline. It's a form of compensatory discrimination, you know, compensates for past injustices. It's a mode of integration, which is still different. Uh, it is simply a mode of empowerment. You could actually have lots of empowerment and lots of discrimination at the same time. It is about diversity, for diversity's sake. Or it could be about a particular view of what counts as the legitimacy of institutions and societies. And this you might call broadly a mirror theory of representation, that India is not a collection of individuals, it's a confederation of castes. Any system is legitimate only if it mirrors that confederation of caste. Now, these are all very different narratives. They overlap in some cases. And I think the consensus was that in the case of Dalits, right, the overlap was so great, both in terms of the, 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 the appalling degree of historical marginalization they had experienced, but it really didn't matter what justification you gave. I mean, the point was something needed to be done. I think the introduction of other backward castes into the narrative of, as it were, compensatory discrimination, and particularly post-Mandal, one of its biggest casualties has been that to, is, is, to, is, is in a sense there is no clear shared constitutional understanding now, and the court has not clarified it, of what is this regime of reservation supposed to be about, right? Uh, and if you don't have that shared understanding, right, then it is much harder to design instruments and targeting mechanisms. So if you ask the question of any reservation regime, why are you targeting somebody? I think there was consensus, right, on, on at, least, at least in the case of Dalits. Who needs to be targeted, right? So, so your view of the creamy layer, whether the creamy layer should be excluded, depends on whether or not you think, for example, the mirror theory of representation is really what you're looking for in a political system, right? Uh, if you actually buy that narrative, then there's absolutely no reason to exclude the creamy layer, right? So I think we are at that juncture where the reality, the institutional reality of reservations is very widely entrenched along the dimensions that Mark Allenter sketched out and, and unlikely to be overturned. I mean, uh, it's absolutely strong. Even the CPM supports all of this and sort of, you know. Uh, uh, but I think what is being lost in the process is I think a clarity about, a shared understanding about what this narrative is supposed to be about which is then leading to an immense 
confusion, if you like, and a politics of resentment around why are particular groups being targeting, not others. So that, that's, that's, in a sense, the first, first point. And, and I, think, I think one of the good things about the American courts, even when they've sort of decided, gone the wrong way from a normative point of view, is that I think at least they constantly force this question. Right? What is this about? Is it about diversity? Is it about discrimination? Um, and, 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 and so on. The second thing I think that has happened is the political, as it were, confusion between other backward castes and Dalits. So a narrative, a special narrative about the place they had in Indian society, which belonged to the Dalits for, for, for overwhelming historical reasons, has, if you like, been hijacked by all other kinds of groups. And even though the Supreme Court at the margin tries to make a distinction between them, in some senses, the politics of affirmative reservation right, has now, in a sense, become much too much associated with the politics of basically assertion and empowerment of any group. So, so who deserves reservation? Practically anybody who can actually claim that assertion politically. Right? I mean, that's, that's in a sense that I... And I think what that has done is that that has closed off some very deep questions that need to be asked about the question of Dalits in India. Uh, Dalits in India. So one of the casualties of the reservation discourse in India and in Indian institutions is we have now no language of thinking about discrimination precisely because we have granted reservation, right? I mean, so, you know, in, in, in some senses it's, 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 it's right? Um, the second thing it has done, and, and there I think the contrast with the U.S. is striking, that insofar as the U.S. has had some success, I think the institutional discourse was meant to move along with and did manage to move what you might call the ethical discourse around diversity and res reservation, right? So that if you wanted an integrated society, it's not simply a question of what social resources the state hands out to different groups. It is fundamentally a question about how citizens relate to each other in interpersonal settings. Do you eat with them on the same table? You know. Do you eat with African Americans on the same table and so on and so forth? Ironically, in modern India, I think there's this period from roughly about the 1920s to 1950s, 60s, which is in its own limited way is an articulation of that ethical requirement. I mean, which we now kind of dismiss condescendingly, uh, uh, you know, Swami Chitanand, uh, you know, Gandhi, all of that, where fundamentally they see this problem as a problem of this ethical relationship. I think what institutionalized reservation has in a sense paradoxically done is A, there is no social movement articulating that ethical requirement, right? So in fact, in the very same institutions and the very same people who in a sense express their progressive credentials, right? By hitching their mass to the system of comp compensatory discrimination are actually in a sense least interested not only not least interested, arguably, in some cases, sort of almost opposed to all the ethical requirements that would actually take to move society in a different dimension. So we need to ask this interesting question, which Ambedkar was always, I mean, I mean one of the nice things about Ambedkar, he's, he's such an amazing moral psychologist of power, right? Is what is it that the system of reservations has done to, in a sense, the ethical thinking we have about the relationship between citizens? Has it actually enhanced it, in the, uh, moved it in the right direction? Or ha has it, in a sense, been ethics on the cheap, if you like? Right? And I suspect a lot of the political consensus around it, including amongst, I think, leaders of you know, various political parties, is that this is emancipation, emancipation on the cheap, right? which is, you have reservations. What else do you need? So this is producing a profound, I think, misrecognition of what it will take to move India towards a genuinely integrated society of equality. A profound misrecognition, both of the material conditions of that movement, right? investment in education, all the, all the busing stuff, all the hard work that needs to be done base up, right? But also a misrecognition in a sense of the kinds of ethical relationships that have to be created in institutions for this movement to be made, made, you know, made, 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 made possible. And I think this misrecognition at both levels has this strange consequence of, I think, widening the trust deficit within Indian society. 
So there is a legitimate complaint whenever you talk about opening up this conversation, you know, look, let's invest more in education. Why aren't, you know, why aren't politicians getting more agitated about the quality of our institutions, which will actually have a much more meaningful impact on the lives of those they want to empower than others? Is that in this context where there is a trust deficit about the ability of the state right, to, in short order, address those material conditions, where you don't have political movements and reform movements that are addressing the ethical questions around integration. Right? Reservation is this, sort of, is, is this kind of default position that everybody converges to. Well, there's nothing else going on, so let's have re reservation. And so I suspect, and this is the thought I will close, which is that I think it's going to take even longer in some sense. I mean, unless those material conditions improve substantially, and you know, there's some movement in that direction. I think I, I do think we are beginning. To be, we will see a, a qualitative change in in primary education. I think in five to ten years, I, I do think the curve is turning on that. Uh, unless those material preconditions are addressed, right, I think reservation is going to be this complicated sort of amalgam of all these different objectives that I talked about. Uh, and you're unlikely to get clarity on the basic questions of who are you targeting, why are you targeting them, how are you targeting them, what are the objectives of targeting uh, uh, them. And the last and final, just the closing thought, which is that I do think Ambedkar's normative vision was that there should be these forms of compensatory discrimination as instruments uh, for empowerment. Uh, but his fundamental vision of Indian constitutionalism was also the other articles. This is, an, this is a constitution about individual freedom. This is a constitution whose normative vision is to emancipate people from compulsory identities. Right? And the interesting, now again, emancipating people from compulsory identities is a complicated social process. Endogamy will have to break down. Again, all the material conditions for social mixing will have to be created. But I think the danger in contemporary India is that that emancipatory vision of a society free of those kinds of compulsory identities is also in the danger of being obscured by the way we have thought of these compensatory discriminatory policies.